So cool. It is us. This is us. This is us. <laughs> so there will be tears and <laughs> lots of emotions, just like and this gnashing is us. of teeth. Yeah. Yes. No, no. That was just me being, being silly. All right. So I guess we will start, I guess. Yeah, we can get going. So we have a, a guest for the first time in a long time, really. Um, yeah. I think the last time we had a guest, they ended up sticking around. I think it was Jen, wasn't it? No, we um, had um, your buddy that does the the action figures. Yeah, we had uh, Risky. Chad, and we right? had Sarah, who was a Dune uh, expert. That's and, right. You know, That's right. Titan. Well, but that was a while ago. We're talking like yeah, it's been a minute. April, May. Oh, and yeah. then of course Leah. We had Leah too. That's right. So. Yeah, our Canadian import. That's when I learned just how strong a Canadian action, accent actually is. That accent is no joke. But this time around, we've got another guest from, you guessed it, the Bay Area from right. the Fighting Grizzlies, the Black <laughs> and Orange. Um, and our guest is Saloni. Saloni, say hello to the internet audience. Hi, internet audience. And thank you for having me, you guys. Thank you for having me as a guest. I appreciate that. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Uh, yeah, we're super excited. It, it just kind of came together as an idea last week and we threw it together and and as we so often do we made whatever happened happen um we like I said we don't uh we're not the best of planners we're not the best of uh but we do work well on our feet so nice. so yeah so you're new to the show new to podcasts and so mm -hmm. the best thing that we can do for you is just throw you into the hot water um so we know your name is Saloni we know you're from California you know you're from Cal High class of 95 just like everybody else four actually but uh, 94, 94? Yes. oh my yes. god you're so old <laughs> I know um, right that one year makes a huge yeah, difference <laughs> here with all those kids then um so we like to talk about pop culture so what is your like I don't know what's your jam with pop culture are you Movies, music, TV. What's your what's your thing? That is a great question. I would say it is a blend of um, all those different forms. You know, when I first hear about pop culture, I think, or just that term, I think, oh, I, I don't know much about. You know, I I grew up watching sitcoms and watching all the childhood like favorite movies, um, Goonies. Uh, but I feel like in more recent times, um, life happens and I, I just have been quite busy. And so my initial reaction or initial answer is, oh, I don't know much. But then when I actually start thinking about the shows that I've seen, especially in the last 10 years, uh, I've realized, especially with Netflix, with streaming, it's easy to, to really fall into that rhythm of watching one show after another and, uh, I have probably watched a lot more shows than I give myself credit for. So I have to really think about like what I've seen. Um, but yeah, so my reference to pop culture to answer your question is um, in terms of show, I think I tend to watch more shows than I do movies and primarily because function of time, it's easier to watch an hour long show versus an hour and a half or two hour long movie in one sitting. Um, so that is my first choice. I tend to watch movies and when I when I do, it's when I have a longer period of time, like go over the weekend or something like that. Um, also, uh, I like to read, uh, love music. Uh, so right now my big music source is Spotify where these curated playlists are presented um, based on an algorithm. So AI is basically doing all that. And most of the time it gets it right. And sometimes it's it's a mess, but. That is my my final answer of my reference to pop culture. So I would be oh, go, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I would be remiss because I know that you uh, contributed um, to some of the content indirectly. You know, a, a couple episodes ago, we had talked about BOA, and we had also talked about um, uh, after another Earth, another Earth mm -hmm. uh, with Britt Marling, and and you had suggested those shows after we got into a deep conversation about like the afterlife and like etern you know, eternity and near-death experiences and all that. Um, so I guess my question for you is 
you know, how did you discover Brit Marling and that whole After Earth OA thing? You know, because because I mean, I I definitely try to evangelize it for the the viewing audience, but I want to give you a chance to do it for for us as well. Great. Well, thank you. Um, great question. How I discovered Brit Marling. Uh, so it happenstance. I, I was living in San Francisco at the time, and near me was uh, the Sundance movie theater. And this was um, 2011. And it just so happened to be a film festival. I forget which what kind of film festival. So my friend and I decided to, we randomly, uh, we based our choice of what movie we wanted to see based on what worked with our schedule. So we just randomly picked a movie day and time and it just worked. There happened to be seats available uh, and it happened to be another earth. And the great part about it is, well, first, I didn't know what I was getting into. I didn't know anything about the movie. I just knew that it had won all these accolades and, and various film festivals. Um, but the super cool part was that Britt Marling, um, the another uh, main actor, I'm forgetting his name, and the producer were there. So after we watched the movie, they did a QA. and a And it just made such a, um, a deep impression on me, especially the way uh, how Britt Marling answered these questions and how the producer answered them. And you could just tell they had this um, great working chemistry in terms of how they developed the plot for Another Earth and the topics um, and the themes they chose to address. So I, I love the fact that uh, to me, just Britt Marling seemed like a very deep thinker and very thoughtful, um, interested in sort of a... Um, parallel reality sci-fi type phenomenon but in this backdrop of a story um a, a story of heartbreak and sort of a love story as well so that was years ago and then fast forward i want to say 2014 although i could be wrong about the the, the year when oa came out i think maybe it was after that I come across the OA and since I knew of Britt Marling and since I had seen her in person it just made such a lasting impression on me um, and I was even more interested in the OA once I learned what it was about and just blown away by it when I watched it because it touched on those themes of supernatural, uh, near-death experiences, certain themes that I don't see shows and movies covering um, to this deeper extent. And I love that kind of stuff. Like I can eat that stuff up and consume it all day. I just, I love that kind of phenomena. So anytime I get a glimpse of it, or if I get even more of a more substantive version of any sort of uh, movie or show or anything, pop culture, if you will, that covers those themes, I'm going to consume that. So yeah, that show had a huge impact on me because it did address these interesting themes. And it did it with a very interesting story that just it kept me um, into it. And I wanted to keep watching the next episode. So that, cool. that was my background on it. Well, I'm grateful you introduced it because I definitely enjoyed season two, uh, well, season one and season two. And um, it's a shame that it didn't continue because uh, I think the performances were good. And Kingsley Ben Adir, not Ben Kingsley Adir, um, <laughs> you know, did a good job uh, in there as well. And he's 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 uh he was in the Barbie movie and uh, and a lot of other things. Kevin, you were going to say something earlier, and I hope you remember what you're going to say. I, I have no idea what it was, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> um, what I can say now is that I, I do understand sitting down and and hearing the people that create the show and getting a like a better vibe from that or, or, or a vibe that makes you more interested in it. Um, I don't know if Andrew told you, but we went to New York comic-con last year and we saw the star Trek panels. And so the, when they were up there talking about star Trek, Picard, you see all of these people that have worked on a show for so long that have this camaraderie with each other. Um, you see the, the, um, the director, for the first time in a long time, it just gets it. So this stuff, you know, you see these people that are doing this thing that they love and it draws you in. It makes you more interested in it, I think. Um, I think if, uh, if if they know what they're talking about and they know that they love it, then it makes it more interesting to me because if, if they love what they're doing, then then they're going to do their, their best at it. But Absolutely, it, that's a great point. The passion yeah, shows. Exactly, exactly. And, and I think... 
Star Trek's one of those things you get you get a the right group of nerds together and you get something really <laughs> special, you know, um, because there's so much there's so much history and so much lore and so much stuff behind it that, you know, it, it does take somebody that, that really cares about it to get it right. Um, and, and that's not always easy to do. Um, but so you said you like supernatural and, and, uh, you know, thoughts of, you know, afterlife and, and, um, uh, near the experiences and all that. And you said you read, what's your, who's your author of choice? Wow. Uh, I have several different authors and it, and it ranges from, interesting self-help to like extreme woo woo. So it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a different range. But uh, if I had to pick one particular author that has had the biggest impact on me in terms of these themes of, um, I, I would probably call it more meta metaphysical type themes. Like yeah, uh, it would be the Seth books um, by Jane Roberts. And it's a series of books where um, Seth is this entity that's channeled through this woman named Jane Roberts. And these books were written in the 60s and 70s and uh, up until like the early, early 80s before um, up until Jane Roberts' death. And uh, just very powerful. It really talks about the power of your mind, uh, but it goes beyond that. It really starts to talk about uh, very like parallel realities and probable realities and infinite selves and um, alternate realities. And I do see some of those themes slightly touched upon in certain shows and movies. And when I, when I get that, I just, I want to, I want to see more of it. So I would love uh, for certain creators to take that risk and really delve deeper into those themes in a way that yeah, that, that is going to question um, even religion. And I think that's a little bit of a fear, um, understandably, because it is going to really shake up a belief, a big core belief system that people have. That I think the planet in general, some people I, just, there, there is more of this trend of people are starting to question it, but not everyone wants to admit it for fear. So yeah, I think just taking that risk of saying, fuck it, we're going to we're going to do this and invest our money and getting a network or whoever they have to get in terms of producers to invest in something that is going to be uh, may trip up the mainstream a little bit is what I would love to see more of. You kind of read my mind because as you were talking, like, I think we're all pretty creatively minded people here. Like I know Kevin is a pretty gifted screenwriter who like was a finalist for a, a, a screenwriting project um, I know we've talked about we've had a few conversations. I'm not going to blow up your spot, uh, but I also know that you may or may not have some, uh, you know, connections who have made films. But in any event, uh, hearing about this, I think is it Seth? Is that what it's called, Seth? Yeah, it, like my producer hat. I'm wanting to mine this this stuffing out of this. I'm like, yo, there's a book series from the '60s to the '80s. It's already done, dude. Like, let's make this series it doesn't have to be exactly it but we're basing it off it like the credits is going to say based on the set series by jane roberts like how has someone not figured this out yet i think the the appetite is there um yeah i, I think it's brilliant um so that was my question can this be made is it like a narrative or is it like can it be made into something that people can watch like what what's the what is the experience of reading one of these books the books are pretty densely packed with information and in my opinion, mind blowing information. So it does take, uh, it took me, for example, a long time just to get through one book because every page is packed with something that is completely changing um, what we've been taught about life and creation, if you will, and just our own inner power. And also about atoms, molecules, space, and time. It really starts to touch upon even these like sci-fi type themes that science is now starting to prove. Um, like, uh, and I could be, but my science on this isn't entirely accurate. So uh, I'm gonna just try to say this to the best of my ability, but I think there's been some experiments done um, where uh, an electron has disappeared and then reappeared. Um, 
and it, it happened so quickly to the point where they're starting to realize, wait a minute, there is something, there may be some truth to um, possibly tapping into another dimension um, and a, a way to, to possibly maneuver that. But again, I could be, I may have articulated that incorrectly, but there is, they're starting to find some scientific evidence behind this. Um, but in terms of to answer your question, Andrew, like how um, a book like this could possibly be turned into something, the, the books are very nonfiction. So it is just more about teaching, like more as a guide of like how you can implement certain things. A good part of it is really about unlearning what we've been taught and learning something completely new. And it's hard. It's hard to let go of um, just basic teachings of is there one reality or are we all living in our own different realities but we've on a, another level we have subconsciously agreed to the basics of like um, certain themes that like in a backdrop of a city or a backdrop of you know we've got mountains and we all can see those mountains so there are certain basics that are there but we're living in our own bubble of what we're creating based on our own perception right so I think a cool way possibly to make something, uh, to turn this into something would be to create a very interesting story, but using these themes uh, in a way that demonstrates and can explain to people what these books or what these themes are really saying um, from probably different uh, storyline perspectives. So it could be multiple stories of various people, either in a movie or a series, or, an anthology. Uh, Boom. It, it, well, it makes me think of something yeah. like, and it's not the same, but it makes me think of something like Sense8, where you have people in different locations that are, you know, experiencing something together, but they're not necessarily together. And so they ha each one of them has their own story, but it, it, you know, ultimately intrinsically ties into the other one, you know. Um, so, so uh, and it's not necessarily the same idea, but if you're creating a story like that to to do it like that would work it doesn't necessarily have to be an anthology because you could bring these people together um at some point you know if you're trying it depends on what kind of show you're trying to make if you really are trying to make an anthology like um uh black what's mirror. a black mirror or what's the american horror story is the one i was trying to think of but something that, that changes you know black mirror is every episode uh, american horror story is every season i mean you could change it up um, and do that, or you could do something that, you know, like I said, brings people together. Um, with all the spiritual stuff, have you, have you ever heard of Sylvia Brown? Yes. Okay. Yes, I have. So funny, funny, funny story that I don't think uh, I've talked about on this show before. Uh, she was my mom's high school English teacher. No way. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, like my mom, my mom like knew her, my mom's met her. Um, you know, she's, she's been to a couple of her, her shows and readings. So that's just funny. Like you were talking about all the, uh, all the spiritualism kind of stuff and, and things like that. And it just popped into my head. So Kevin, oh my goodness. Um, oh. uh, that movie, um, shoot, not barbarian, hereditary, hereditary ruined mediums for life. Uh, Saloni, <laughs> um, if you ever, there's a horror film called hereditary, you definitely don't need to see it. Cause I know that you don't want to give your imagination more fuel, but man, like there's a, there's a, I hope it's not a spoiler. I don't, you don't care. Like, anyway, there is a scene where there's a medium talking to like a spirit, whatever. And I was like, this is so cool. Yeah, no, dude. Like by the end of the movie, I was like, see, and this is why I will never talk to like a spirit because chances are like, at least, you know, Sylvia, like she makes it all like, oh, comforting. Yes. You know, like everything's okay. Right. No, Red <laughs> Terry. <laughs> I'm, I'm, Kevin's laughing because he knows what I'm yeah. talking about. Yeah, it, it, I'm cured of all curiosity of for that shit. Anyway, okay. but you know what? Maybe Sylvia. I know she's probably not even around anymore. But no, she's not. Yeah, but like maybe she she can bring it back. But anyway, yeah. like, what a small world. Crazy. That yeah. that actually reminds me of um, uh, an early '80s movie called uh, Ouija Board, and it's a scary movie. And it is based on, like the theme is um, a couple, I believe they move into a house or something and they see a Ouija board and they decide to start playing around with it. And they end up channeling some evil spirit that yeah. ends up haunting the, the place and yeah, tries to kill them. So. Yeah, I, yeah, I feel like that has been, 
either remade or um just somebody took the same idea but there's a movie called um ouija that came out within the last like five or six years i think um and in may might be by mike um uh, uh midnight mass mike flanagan oh mike flanagan it might be it might not be i i can't remember um but i remember seeing it so i uh I watch a lot of horror and more horror than I ever used to. So um, I would definitely watch that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, uh, it, it's, it's trippy stuff. So if, if that's your, if that's your gem, like, I know you said you watch TV more than movies. I mean, what's your, what's your favorite TV show? Oh my gosh. That's a, that's a hard question uh, because it, I remember Anne, like Andrew had asked me this question and I thought, well, you know what? It depends on uh, my memory. It depends on my mood. It depends on so many different factors um, because I've had so many favorite shows during certain periods of time in my life. So the all time favorite, I mean, I, I think if I had to pick one, it would probably be more like a sitcom from the the eighties because that's comforting. It's like, comfort food. Um, but in terms of recent times, there's been many that I've seen, but I would say sort of along the lines of the theme of uh, kind of it is a little spiritual, but not really so spiritual. It's more about astral projection, which can be um, covered under like this spiritual thing, like the Seth books and other um, similar authors cover that. But the way this show handles it, it's done in like a total thriller, which makes it even more fun because it is super just like every episode you want to know what happens next. It's called Behind Our Eyes. And yeah, it is. You know, I think it, it came out like maybe a few years ago. Uh, I want to say during the pandemic, it was huge at that time. It's a British thriller. Uh, in fact, Bono's daughter, um, from you two, uh, yeah, you two, um, is, uh, is the lead actress. Yeah. Uh, it says here it was on Netflix. Uh, it premiered February, 2021 and it's based on a 27 team novel of the same name. Um, I know Kim's a big kind of UK ophile, so to speak. So maybe she's seen it. But um, all right. I, I, I'm, I've always believed that the UK kind of does drama better than us. Um, hell, sometimes they do comedy better than us. But um, the way they do their television is just inherently different. We're, we're actually catching up with the streaming era. We've kind of moved towards shorter seasons, uh, tighter stories and things like that. You know, we we had the 24 episode seasons for a long time that were just crazy. Um but the UK has always done, you know, the the four to six to eight episode runs. They have some great dramas. They're cop dramas I love. They have The Fall um, and a few other shows like that that are really, um, really good. And I love their comedy. If you haven't seen Sex Education, that show is fantastic um, and oh. about to end. Um, I've not heard of that. I'll have to keep that one. Oh, it's really good. It's uh, Gillian Anderson um, and Asa Butterfield. And then I think everybody else is pretty much a no name at that point. Uh, but the kid, one of the kids is the one that just took over as the new Doctor Who. Um, so like everybody from that show is like starting to branch out. One of the girls that is one of the main girls on there, um, she gets constantly compared to Margot Robbie because they physically are, they look very similar. Um, and uh, and uh, it's it's it really, really took off. It's on Netflix. And it's really funny. Like if comedy is your thing, um, it's it's really good. It's really good. Nice. Um, right. And I think the last season is coming up. So they're going to end it on whatever season's coming up on Netflix. So if you hold out a little longer, you kind of catch it all at once and just burn through it. Um, but it's really good. Uh, the, the gist of the show is that Julian Anderson's a sex therapist and her son's in high school. Um, and he ultimately, he's a nerd, but 
he kind of becomes the high school's like sex therapist for the kids, like unofficially. So he starts charging people for advice and it, uh, it just goes from there. And it's, uh, it, it's really fun and it's really smart um, and really well-made, but, uh, but it's really good. So I don't know. Do you, Andrew, do you have any other good questions? Um, I think we can, we, we, we can weave them in organically. Um, but in the meantime, uh, maybe we should talk about uh, a movie that, we saw, I guess we, but we can talk about it. You know, I think part of when we, anyway, long story short, Sloney and I at the same time saw Oppenheimer and um, I definitely wanted to talk about it. So yeah, I mean, I can kind of open up with my thoughts uh, or Sloney, if you wanted to talk about your thoughts, thoughts first, you can go first as well, but. Um, yeah, go for it. I'd love right. to hear what you say. So Oppenheimer. Okay, here we go. So I was definitely excited about this movie. Um, you know, I am, I do like disaster films. I know this is not a disaster movie. Like, I know this is not Moonfall. Like, this is like some serious shit, okay? Um, so I was definitely all about that IMAX life. And um, I will say, first of all, like, I don't think you need to see it in IMAX. I think the movie was definitely more on the talky tip than anything like it's just it's all a lot about just Oppenheimer's life flash forward back past present intrigue you know some you know political maneuverings going on you know before he became you know leader of the project to after um you know and and I did get a lot of like people saying oh it's a horror movie or oh it's gonna make you really sad or whatever and, you know, I guess I'm just keeping it 100% on this podcast. Um, I was not the most alert. I was definitely not drowsy, but I wasn't alert. But the film was absolutely at points. Like, I was starting to, like, you know, get a little heavy lidded. So it's a long movie. It's three hours, over three hours long. Um, it is going to make me go and research some of these names. Like, um, Robert Downey Jr.'s character, I had no idea who he was, but apparently he was a... Uh, you know, he played a role in the film, certainly. And anyway, I, I just felt like the movie was a, a think piece. And, um, but I, I was a little let down. And I can see why it wasn't just that Barbie was this like fun, light film. Um, I think I might actually go on record and say, it actually kind of was a better film because it, I think, delivered more of what it promised. Whereas I think Oppenheimer, I don't know if as a person, he deserved a three hour movie to basically talk about um, him as a person. It really was about him. It wasn't so much about even like the bomb and everything else. It was really about him. And yeah, it, it kind of left me a little, a little cold. Wow, that was really mean. <laughs> so let me, you go. <laughs> Uh, so interesting. Um, I, I, I agree that it did not need to be three hours. Uh, I think like a good 45 minutes of it could have been just removed. It was unnecessary because it just covered certain details that really didn't need to be there. And I agree with you. There were, um, uh, moments in the movie that I also felt tired. It was a lot of dialogue I would say it's probably, it was more in the the middle of the movie where it just, uh, it was moving, but it was just, it wasn't moving. It didn't feel like it was moving forward. It was just sort of stagnant. And that's when I, I did nod off a little bit and just felt like, oh my God, this is a very long movie. Um, but then it started to pick back up again and I became more alert and then was able to follow the plot line. I, um, actually felt when the are we so I guess we can do spoiler alerts and whatnot yeah, here. yeah. So, okay. Spoiler. Uh, okay all right uh when the test bomb was happening um I did like the fact that Christopher Nolan and whoever was part of the decision making process chose to uh, initially make it quiet so in that scene, you could just process because it's the whole buildup, right? To, you know, is this test bomb going to work or not? 
or is the test going to work? So it's this whole build up to it. And then uh, there's all this other noise and there's moments where earlier in the movie, they show um, Oppenheimer's like thought process or visualize or what he's imagining. And it was just being in IMAX, it was just really loud. Uh, but I thought it was unique that in that moment where you're expecting to hear something loud and um, yes, enormous, it was quiet. And as you're processing everything, then the big sound comes afterwards. So I, I thought that part was well done. What I liked about the movie was, I think that it did cover some important in very subtle ways, not like in your face ways, but in a, in a way where you can feel it, which is um, the conflict that Oppenheimer and that whole crew, and I think just people in general perhaps go through when they're tasked with an important job, you know, it's for the good of the country or for possibly humanity. Um, and in this case, they were trying to build something, a bomb basically to stop Hitler. I mean, that's a noble cause, right? So, you know, how, of course, people would want to get behind that, right? We've got to stop this evil person. And then, then of course, the end result ends up changing. Um, but the conflict of, trying to create that and putting all your genius and your intellect and everything in your work ethic and day in and day out, investing everything that you have in trying to create this, um, reaching the pinnacle, creating it, um, the test is a success. So you get lost in that whole process because the end result is trying to create this thing, this bomb to make sure it works without thinking through or it, perhaps representing all these unintended consequences that happen, which is you're, you've created a bomb that's going to destroy lives. And I thought that the, the movie did a good job of addressing the conflict and tension that Chris, uh, Oppenheimer like uh, experienced in that process of like, yes, we won, but did we really win? as humanity, do we really win in terms of human race because it ends up creating this um, whole Cold War situation and all these other unintended consequence, consequences that um, in some ways it could be argued that was worse for humanity. So I don't know. So I think it just did address that tension and it did show how he had a difficult time when he's giving a speech, he started to see people burning and their skin falling off. And, you know, just, I think it like, it did reflect on how uh, difficult uh, of an issue that he had in terms of grappling with what he had created, what he was a part of. So I did like that part of it. Yeah. Um, so basically, you know, one of the things that I definitely, and I, 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 as, as you were talking, I'm like on Google to, 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 to basically make, make sure I understand, I'm not the one misunderstanding. So we were talking about Christopher Nolan and I was talking about like his choices in terms of films. And I know Dunkirk uh, was another historical kind of mm -hmm. World War II film that came out. And I, I get the sense that it didn't really do what it was supposed to do. I remember all the trailers were coming out and, you know, it did well, but I don't think it really blew up. And my whole thing was, was Dunkirk like really, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna feel terrible if I'm wrong, but was it really that important to the war effort? I mean, I know it was an evacuation, but like I never really heard of Dunkirk before the movie came out. And I don't think people are really talking about Dunkirk now after the movie. So I'm wondering, Nolan, maybe you're taking these subjects and you're giving them a lot more like just airtime than, than they need like if I was making a movie about the Manhattan Project I would make it about the Manhattan Project I would actually give like Einstein a bigger role I would give some of the other scientists a bigger role I would actually spend more time in Hiroshima and Nagasaki you know instead of focusing in on this one dude who is like a flawed guy but apparently is a bit of a genius like that's cool. I will say, uh, I don't know if it's Cillian or Killian, but either way, I'll say Killian. Killian Murphy, he disappeared in the role. I think he actually did a very good job portraying Oppenheimer. I didn't think of him as the guy from 28 Days Later or Peaky Blinders. That was not, no, that was 
fucking Oppenheimer. So I think he he killed it. He killed that role. But you know, I I, I just you know it's a well made film. Don't be wrong. It was a well made film. I think if you're a super high minded like you know you know person who's just into like the craft of filmmaking, it almost felt like JFK, but not all like conspiracy theorists. But it it, it reminded me a bit of like an Oliver Stone film because of the all the political maneuvering and intrigue that goes on on with it. But you know, maybe I'm just jonesing for the Dark Knight trilogy again. I don't know. I will also say I'm rambling. I don't care. I will also say the score was sick. And I was wondering the whole time, is it Hans Zimmer again? No, dude, it wasn't Hans Zimmer. It was Ludwig Van Borensen, who I think is now, he's a heavyweight. So Ludwig yeah. started off, he was roommates with uh, Ryan Coogler um, from the Black Panther films. So Ludwig did the Black Panther score. He did the Mandalorian score. He did the Black Panther, uh, the, the Creed score. Um, and he did this score. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm calling it now. He is definitely getting nominated for an Oscar for this score. I think the, the way the music was done in this movie, the way the sound was done, like you to your point, Sony, about the silence before the boom, that the, the music and the sounds was a huge part of the experience. So yeah, man, I think we're just, yeah, I, I would give it a B. You know, it, it wasn't an A and I wanted an A. Well, it's interesting that you bring up the sound because that makes me think of... Um... What was the second of the Star Wars? Um, Thank sequels? you, Kevin. That's when. exactly the Last Jedi when yeah. they hyperspace and it's silence, but it's bright light and the boom. That was my favorite scene of the Last Jedi. Yeah. Favorite scene. Yeah, it, it was brilliant, and for the same reason, like it, it, it takes this thing where y- your brain says you you should hear this thing, and instead it it, it kicks you in the face with silence. And then it cuts into the next scene where there's sound and it, it you know, all the chaos and everything. But um, it's 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 a really cool, I think, technique to use, especially when it makes sense. Like if you see uh, the test explosion, you actually won't hear the explosion before you see it. So you'll see it, and because light travels faster than sound, you know, the sound doesn't get to you until you know a, a few seconds later. So it would be silent for a minute. Um, the other thing is funny that you compared it to JFK and conspiracy theories because there's two things in the in the movie um, that are questionable. So there's an early scene apparently where he poisons an apple. Mm-hmm. Uh, his family is super pissed about that. They're like he he definitely never did that. Like they're like that never happened. It's never been corroborated. Blah blah. blah. Um, and the second is when Florence Pugh's character is dying um supposedly there's if you look there's there's like two hands in black gloves yes and so the conspiracy theory behind that is a real life conspiracy theory was she murdered and was she in fact murdered by the u.s government yeah. so um those those things are there they're not quite as in your face as jfk but but there there's some things in there that are not necessarily true um i think i also heard that this movie is based on a book about oppenheimer okay um probably loosely i probably along the lines of of like hamilton which was based on um a book about alexander hamilton that lynn manuel miranda bought in a you know the airport and, and fell in love with it and ended up making a movie out of it so or sorry a musical out of it um but uh but yeah i i i the those things are cool i think for me I'm still super curious about it. Even if it's long, I'll probably, once it comes out, I'll probably watch it in like two or three chunks, right? Which is easier. Um, But as somebody that studied physics and as somebody who has, you know, read the stuff, I I think I may have a little more curiosity about those things that are slower um, than, than maybe some other people necessarily would. I think it's definitely, um, it's like, if you watch a beautiful mind, there's, there's stuff in there that's heavier than, you know, just normal conversation. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely curious. I'm still curious about it. Like I can't, I can't wait for it to come out. I just, I'm not going to see it in the theater. I am actually more likely to see Barbie in the theater than I am to see Oppenheimer. Um, just because of all the hype, which I think Barbie just crossed the billion dollar mark this week, which is yeah. absolutely uh-huh. wild. Yeah, actually, um, we're being organic here. Uh, Salona, you saw, we'll, we'll jump back and forth. You saw Barbie too, right? So, any I thoughts did, yeah. 
Yeah, it's well, it's definitely a fun movie. It's 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 made very well. And I agree with your earlier point that it, it it's it's a great movie because it you get what you expect. It delivers. It um oh, you articulated it uh, better than that. But um but yeah, no, I thought overall it was light, fun. What I what I really liked about it was it did touch upon gender roles and um certain, you know, just disparities and issues that um, are important to address, but it does it in a way that is entertaining and interesting and um, has a really cool storyline with a beautiful, I mean, just the set and the scenery and how, you know, just Barbie land or Barbie world is just beautiful and, you know, um, and how it changes. Um, America Farah's speech, that was powerful. Like that is something that I would want to go back and, and listen to again, because it just does, it was very moving and relatable. So yeah, all in all, a great movie. Um, it, it was fun to watch. I will say though, comparing it to Oppenheimer, I think is unfair only because it just coincidentally, I mean, those two movies were released on the same day and it, it sucks for Oppenheimer because like, <laughs> You can't, I mean, Barbie's going to win. It's just, it's so, it's a relatable, fun, light theme, has an all-star cast. Oppenheimer does too. But uh, yeah, overall, I thought it was a good, great movie. I think it's yeah. interesting because I don't think those two movies were fighting for an audience. So I, I think Christopher Nolan said it best. He's like, I love that these movies are coming out at the same time. It's not a competition. We just want people in the theater. And with those two movies playing at the same time, it was one of the biggest weekends in forever. Like it, it was a huge weekend for 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 the cinema. Yeah, probably That's the biggest true. weekend post pandemic potentially. Yeah, I would and think. The yeah. Urban Heimer thing. It's just it was it was just a cool little like you know humanity doing its thing. Humans are going to human. You know, we're going to make memes about whatever, and they decided to make. Uh, yeah, it was like free advertising for both films yeah. that people fell in love with this thing and they were making posters and and doing everything. I think it was really cool. And there, there was a significant number of people that saw both movies in the same day. So it's yeah. not like it was not, you know, it's not like they were completely separated from each other. So it's interesting that the two films that are so different, so you know, different. everything about them is different. And um, they... They both did well in their own right. Like I said, Oppenheimer yeah. is rated R, right? It has to be because there's there's, there's um, oh yeah there's you, got, you got there. Killian Murphy's uh, oh yeah hand yeah, yeah. flapping around in the wind. So as, as a matter yeah. of fact, I didn't see that. I, I, yeah. I, I that didn't happen. At least not in our cut. Now now um, Florence definitely um, you yeah. know wasn't shy, uh, but no, I didn't see any Killian stuff hmm. going on. I, I hadn't either. And I remember hearing about or like there's full frontal. I'm like, okay, when is that going to happen? But yeah, I, I didn't see it. It's because you guys know his eyes are up here. You're looking. <laughs> <laughs> Very respectful people. Oh, so well done. So that's hilarious. So, all right, cool. Well, Oppenheimer was pretty much the best movie you guys have seen all year. So we'll, we'll hold on to that. Um, and then. I don't know. You want to talk about cult leaders? Um, sure. Uh, I definitely was going to. Uh, yeah, I, I confirmed it was indeed rated R. Uh, yeah. Cult leaders: How to be a cult leader. So, on the last episode of the APMC, um, we talked about. I talked about the first episode, but then I basically finished all six episodes. And um, I definitely want you, Kevin, to talk as well, because I'm all about that research while I talk. Uh, but episodes two, three, four, five, and six, I think were also good, but I felt like they kind of diminished in terms of my interest level. Um, but the second episode was about Jim Jones, and I had no idea that Jim Jones, all I knew about Jim Jones was you go into like Guyana and had people drink Kool-Aid and they die. That's but I didn't know that Jim Jones actually was like part of the San Francisco political machine and definitely was part of like the civil rights movement. Like he actually was like a legit dude before he went nuts. Like what? Then the third dude who was all like, you know, Botox man, 
Like that was just kind of weird, you know, but then the, the creepiest one of all for me was the, um, the yoga cult uh, guy from Japan who basically unleashed that gas attack, like in the subway. Like I remember hearing about the gas attack in the subway, but when you actually learn about this dude and how he got popular and school kids were singing his songs, yeah. and he was actually like on talk shows and even ran for public office but then when he got when he lost that's when he lost his damn mind and became murderous or even the fact that like you know some dude after seeing like you know somebody get killed was gonna go to the cops and they found him like yeah, we gotta kill him too like when yeah. they start killing their own members like what so but the, and, and and by the end of the and you, you'll talk in a second by the end of the series they don't let up they're like so now that you know how to become a cult leader, you know, then they're like, and this is the best time to do it with social media. Everyone's just walking for a leader. Like, I'm like, where, what are they trying to do here? Are they, is Netflix <laughs> really trying to like birth some new cult leaders? Because the play, they kept calling it a playbook. Dude, this yep. show was like, and the fact that I'm getting ex excited about it is a little bit disturbing. But anyway, this show <laughs> Basically, it literally lays it all out. And and the best part about it is the the, the last guy, like he won. Like he, did he was it. immortal. He like legit he basically, did it. Basically, his cult, dude, his his cult is responsible apparently for supplying sushi to like the majority of American restaurants. You know how loaded he is? His cult started the Washington Times. Okay, that's a pretty big conservative newspaper like he's bawling out of control from korea because he just said like jesus failed his mission so jesus appeared to him and said hey man like i suck can you like take over for, for me? yeah <laughs> guy's like no and he's like well god we need you he's like oh okay you know and then he fucking just sold that story to the world and they bought it yeah Yo, like swaths right. of people yeah but take uh, it away man I'm yeah just... i I, I think it's interesting because you pointed out that the first episode was probably the best one and it starts to slip there. Um, and I think part of that is because the first two episodes are pretty much focused on just two people, right? Like yeah. you get Charles Manson, which I think is a, is already a sort of well-known, but interesting story. Um, and then you've got, you know, Jim Jones that we, again, we sort of know about, um, but what makes these guys interesting to hear about too is the fact that they failed pretty hard. You know, like obviously Charles Manson did some crazy shit, uh, you know, killed killed some people, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. And there was some interesting stuff in there. The whole thing about, you know, trying to record in the Beach Boys studio, um, or, you know, or at the Beach Boys house and and all that is, is a little crazy. Um, like you said, with Jim Jones hearing about how he really was, not the worst guy at first, but it seems like when he really started to get into drugs that everything went, you know, kaboom. Um, and then I think, I, I do think the, the last episode is really interesting because it's somebody that it basically made no mistakes. Yeah. Like he, he did this thing, he created a whole thing and now he's passed it on to his wife and kids um, in a few different ways and they're worth billions of dollars you know because he said i am the new messiah yeah. and people were like oh okay like i i don't understand like that's why i don't understand cults even after watching this like i don't get it i don't know how you walk into a room how you have the right charisma to be able to just say you know jesus was okay but i'm the next guy and everybody's like oh cool okay yeah we're on board like i i don't get it you know, I, I, if I could do it, I mean, sure, you know, I could, I could use some followers, but like, I, it's, it's wild to me. It's totally crazy. The whole cult thing is just crazy to me. And we've seen, you know, a few of them recently, like we, it, it's funny that they didn't really touch on um, Scientology at all. Oh, and they, mm. they, gl they glanced over Nexium for like two seconds. Like they brought up Allison Mack. They, they, I think they brought her up more than they brought up Keith Rainier, and then it was just gone. Yeah, but I like, I like that one because it was all about like make sure you have good recruiters or whatever. Like, mm -hmm. and then that was basically Keith Rainier's strategy, like make sure that you know whoever's recruiting for you 
like is dope, you know? So, and next scene was all about celebrities, you know, and, and, and it's a great dovetail in Scientology because Scientology is absolutely using that playbook yeah. by using celebrities to make their religion look cool. Like, you know, I'm not gonna lie. Like, you know, Tom Cruise, people hate on Tom Cruise, but I respect the dude because I mean, yeah, he's weird, but like, dude, like you, no one, if anyone thought that Top Gun Maverick was going to be like the biggest, one of the biggest movies of 2021, yeah. no, I mean, no, you're lying. No one thought it was going to be a big hit and it fucking killed. And the dude is like damn near 80. I'm joking. He's like 60 and yeah. he's still doing his own stunts and, you know, his, his mission impossible. Although this latest film apparently is not really doing that well, which is like, uh Oh, you know, but, um, Anyway, he's like Scientology's like biggest star, you yeah, know. For sure. But outside of that, you've got like John Travolta. You've got actually, I can't even really think of anybody else right now. Uh, but like, you know, yeah, Scientology's scary, man. Like, I personally, like, yeah, I, they probably they want no parts of Scientology because, yo, I was even out. Scientology of- has lawyers. That's the other thing. Lawyers, right, right? and they just seem gangsters. Yeah. Like I, oh, I was standing sure. outside of a compound in um in Tampa. I didn't know Tampa was the headquarters. So I was in one of my Magellans in Tampa, walking around, and I saw their temple, whatever. And so like I walked by it and I could see like behind the gate, like I was being watched by the Sea Org dudes. Like, you know, they wear like <laughs> the, the sailor type things with yep. the sunglasses. And I'm just like, I'm just Magelloning. I was taking pictures, yes, and that's probably why. But I don't care. Like, well, I did care a little bit because I'm talking about it now. But like, yeah, like, yeah, they wanted no parts. And you're right. Maybe the lawyers would sue the Netflix people into oblivion. Like, they probably would. I mean, maybe not even into oblivion, yeah. but just enough that it would be a pain in the ass, right? And, and, <laughs> and they don't want to deal with it. You don't, don't have time for that. Um, Nexium is an interesting one because Nexium was a it was a pyramid scheme of people. It was like he had dude at the top, Keith Rainier at the top, and he had one or two women underneath him. Um, and I know Alice and Matt kind of moved her way up to be one of those. And then they would bring in people and they, like they barely cover on it, but they would get information on these people and hold it. And so, you know, they'd be like, well, if you want out, cool, but we're going to release this information. And, you know, according to some of the Scientology documentaries that have been made, it's the same thing. Like as soon as they know stuff about you, it's harder and harder and harder to leave. Um, and I think Leah Re- Leah Remini just sued Scientology this week. Um, so like she's she's actively going after them right now. Um, so we'll see what happens there. I don't. She's been an, a, a a very vocal yes uh, non supporter of Scientology for a very long time. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that stuff goes. Um, but yeah. It, the whole color thing is a trip. I I, th- I do. It's a it's an interesting show because it's more fun than it probably should be, right? Yeah. Like, it, it, it's a really interesting way to make a documentary about something that we don't want to see happen, because like, it really is like, well, here's where Charles Manson messed up. Here's the things he did right. Here's the mistakes that he made. Now we're gonna move on to Jim Jones. Here's the thing Jim Jones did right. Here's the mistakes he made. You know, next, and, and, and it breaks down what was the six components, you know, of of what what makes a good cult leader. I know the sixth was immortality, right? Yeah, uh, well, I actually have it pulled up. Um, the the six main things are hold on, because we're gonna we're gonna help you guys. Here we go. If you want to be a cult leader, you're getting it direct from the APNC. Boom. So. <laughs> Number one, you gotta build your foundation. And that's what uh uh Charlie uh, Manson. Charlie yeah. Manson did so well. Second, you gotta grow your flock, and that's what Jim Jones did. Then you have to reform their minds, and that was Jaime Garcia or something. Yeah, yeah. You know, then number four, promise eternity, and that was Heaven's Gate. That was Heaven's um, Gate, yeah. And they, they were weird. Then control your image. And that was the Om Shinrikyo cult. And that was the guy who was all yoga man. And he would take pictures of himself like levitating, which is clearly doctored, but people thought it was real. Yeah. But that was by far actually the creepiest one. In my opinion, I would make a movie out of that shit. Like that, I, I was like. It, it was a trip because it, it 
felt like the one that should have been the least believable. Yeah. Like it was so wild. Like he was almost like a pop star. He was like, he was all these things at once and nobody questioned any of them. And then he, he had somebody make sarin gas and drop it on the subway. Like, you're like, what the, <laughs> like it yeah, made no wow. sense, but it's true. Like it all happened. And then finally, number six, become immortal. And he did it by basically having a wife and lots of kids. And I love how they even said after he died, it became Game of Thrones. And they had to yeah. like, like your fucking Tyrion Lannister is yeah. like uh, <laughs> narrating your damn show. Uh, but I loved that. But yeah, those are the six uh, playbooks. Um, but ultimately, I think, you know, being serious here now, I think that you would think that by making this series and showing all the playbooks, you then kind of vaccinate or help vaccinate people from falling into the trap because yeah. you can yeah. now see, oh, this is what you're doing. I, I I see what you did there. You know, nope, I'm not gonna fall for it. But well, there was dude, one dude though. I, I one dude actually, I think yeah, Heaven's Gate guy. Heaven's Gate guy said, yeah, I do believe that they are on a yep. spaceship somewhere. Yep. Like, yeah, he said dude, he said that there could be one right over a building right now. He just couldn't see it. He's like, and I believe that. And I was like, damn. Yeah, so like, I mean, and but those are the people. Those are the people that do get pulled in the calls. They're they're the ones that just accept, you know, that they're looking for something. And when the right person comes along with the thing they're looking for, it's game over. Like they're just in. Yeah, it's, it's a I, I I would add that like I know there's the the six uh, components that you discussed. Um, there's also a component of controlling your wealth like or your your money source and when you get sucked into something like this I, I took a sociology of cult class way back in the days and it was fascinating and that was one of the things they talked about which is that when you start to attend these meetings and uh, for for some of the cults for example um, they make you feel really good and there's a community and you feel accepted and you feel like you belong somewhere and and you contribute a little bit of money and over time the idea is for these cults to take over your income so you are completely dependent on them for everything yeah. and it's much harder to break away from that they covered that in one of the episodes there there was one cult where yeah everybody the people signed over all their stuff yeah they literally yeah. just were like yeah cool we're in the cult so you know here's here's our stuff we love you and i was just like that's crazy yeah crazy crazy I mean, no. i'm lucky i don't have anything to sign over i'm poor as hell <laughs> i can't be in a cult yeah scientology is not gonna yeah they're not coming for then. me yeah they're gonna be no. like no no you have enough money no i <laughs> love how um the heaven's gate one like they decided like we're aliens you know but then when like one of them died I forgot how they, 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 like he, he flipped it. Like he's like, I remember now the reason why they died was because her body was like impure. So the only way to like actually make it to the next level was to like leave her mortal coil. And that's why she died. It's not yeah. that like she's a, just a mere mortal. Like I, I love how like it's all about the spin, man. And it's didn't, didn't he, didn't he marry spin. her after she died? something like yeah it's yeah, just like, like love how like you know so you have a problem so what do you do you know yeah. like it, it, it is fucking yeah funny. it's a, it was a trip it really was because you know for for somebody that doesn't get satire you're gonna be like this really is like they're just telling you how to be yeah. you know a, a cult leader but it, it really to your point i mean it really is like if you're if you if you're smart enough to watch it, but knowing that you're a little weak willed, um, you can see the way that people would take advantage of you. Um, and I think that's important, but uh, it, it's, it's a definitely an interesting series. I, I recommend it to anybody that's not about to start a cult. Please don't start a cult. That's my, <laughs> my only recommendation. The caveat. Yeah. So. Yeah. But yeah, it, it 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 was interesting. It really was. It was it was something new and different that I wasn't really ready for, and it was it was a lot of fun, um, and really informational. Like I didn't know enough about any of these guys, um, so it was it was a trip. I don't need. To, I don't think. I, I think maybe that was part of it too. I don't think I really gave a shit about the the porn star 
who the loved plastic one? surgery. Yeah, yeah, like, that was like what? I mean, it was um, weird because like, yeah, he actually he did these things and he he com- commanded a good chunk of people. He just wasn't particularly interesting. Where wow. you know, because we are people and we like dark things, like Charlie Manson's inter- interesting because he did crazy shit. Like and he controlled people and had people do crazy shit. And you know, so this other guy, he's like, I want to have plastic surgery, but you need to have plastic surgery first, so I know if it's gonna work. Like, and they just did it. And you're like, okay, but but yeah, this trip. Wow. There's a rapper named Jim Jones as well. He's part of the uh, Diplomats, if you're familiar with him. Uh, 2003, he had a song around 2005. Kind of, kind of goes like, I think we fly, we fly. Uh, anyway, it's a good, it's a good song. I and mean, it's Jim Jones. Anyway, it's just funny how like rappers will take these crazy ass names. And, but Jim Jones, it just, it just fucking works. I, I, I like um his stuff. Anyway, some of his stuff. That was totally random. <laughs> all right so we hit up on oppenheimer we hit up cult members did you have anything else uh not this week but i i do know next week i'm gonna try to finally get into strange new worlds oh i did see a documentary though um about the food supply that was also on netflix i'm totally gonna watch it Um, yeah i'm not watching that i don't need (laughs) to tell me what's wrong with my food i'm gonna eat it anyways i don't care (laughs) I, uh, I, I, I totally didn't watch it. I don't um, need to. I don't need to know what's wrong with tater tots, man. I know they're not right. I'll eat them anyways. <laughs> I think they're going to get organic for... tater tots. <laughs> sure. I think talk shit about the vegetables. Honestly, they're like it's it's going to be more about the stuff that you think is supposed to be like safe. You know what I mean? It jokes on um, them. I only eat red meat. No. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I just I can't watch. I can't watch documentaries about food. Like I never watched Super Size Me. Oh really? Um, and uh and I actually like dude a lot. Um what's Spurlock his name? was his name? Yeah, Morgan Spurlock. He did a really great like series um a few years later um that I can't remember the name of, but he did a really interesting kind of like docu-series that was really a lot of fun. Um and he's a he's a pretty cool guy and and I totally get um what he was doing in that one. But thankfully I'm not a person that eats McDonald's every day, so I was like, yeah, I, I I can respect what you did and I understand it doesn't really affect me. You know, I, I'm lucky if I do McDonald's like once a month, you know, like it's not my, it's go-to. not my go-to thing. So, but like, I get the point. Like if you go to, you know, McDonald's and eat just what they make, it's not going to be good for you. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I can't, I don't do food documentaries. I don't need anybody turning, turning me off of, uh, of my stuff. I've worked in restaurants enough. You know, I just, just feed me. I'm fine. If the steak <laughs> drops on the floor, just throw it back on the grill. It'll burn off the... Wait, does that I really happen? I don't know. I'm sure You're keeping done. the secret. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You're loyal. See, I like... So, so that as a future cult leader, no. Uh, no, I like loyalty. No, I, that's cool. I, I, that's very, yeah, you can definitely be part of the inner circle, baby. There yeah. you go. <laughs> So yeah, it uh, it's 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 funny. It's just like I can't, I can't, you can't tell me about food. Um, but yeah, okay. So if if you don't have anything else, I will. Well, first off, with my kids the other day, uh, before I get to these guys, um, I watched the Super Mario Brothers movie. It is now on Peacock. Um, it is available to stream if you basically if you have Comcast. I think if you've had Comcast for more than a year, they extended their free Peacock trial. So you've got it for like, I think it's two years now. I think I have it for two more years for free um, because I have Comcast. And and so it's on there. Um, watched it with my kids. Uh, it was fun. It was fun. I, I, I it seems to me it was more hyped up um, than I think it probably should have been. And it got a lot of love when it came out. And and it was just fun. It's it's not a movie with a um, with a real purpose. Like Barbie has, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, a very female agenda, right? Like it's pushing these um, th- these ideas out there that people kind of need to hear. And like you said, the whole America Ferrera speech is like solid gold. Like people are leaving the theater crying after that speech. Like people are emotionally impacted by Barbie. And I think if you go see. Um, 
Super Mario Brothers, if you watch the Super Mario Brothers, you know, film at home on TV, it's just fun. It's just, you know, a, a new story. The voice actors are all really good. You know, Chris Pratt does fine. Um, they sneak in the original voice of Mario in an early scene. So it's not like he was completely left out of the film. Um, you know, Charlie Day is funny as Luigi. Um, I love Anya Taylor Joy. So when she plays Princess Peach, she's great. Um, Jack Black sounds not very Jack Blackish. Like some of his mannerisms are there, but he doesn't actually sound like totally like Jack Black. And I think that that's kind of nice too. You know, these guys are pretty recognizable. So for Chris Pratt to be just a hair different and for Jack Black to be just a little different. Um, Anya Taylor Joy is Anya Taylor Joy. Like she sounds exactly the same. Like she didn't change up her voice at all, but um, it just works. It's fun. You know, Super Mario and Luigi against Bowser. They throw in some old school video game like sections. You've got kind of a Luigi's Mansion kind of section that, you know, is is from that video game and things like that. But um, it's just, it's fun. It's pretty, it's shiny, you know, it's new and it'll probably get a sequel. I think it did really well. Um, and, but I do think it was more for the kid set. Like there wasn't a lot of, you know, if you go see Shrek, there's a lot of adult humor that's like tied in. Um, there was less of that in this movie than there is in some, some other, um, kids films. So, um, but it's fine. Kids need their films and I, I don't see any, you know, problem with that. Um, but it was just, it was okay. You know, Kevin, uh, you talking about fun. Um, I've heard from two people so far that the, the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie is actually pretty good. Yeah. So yeah. even though I had like zero interest, like the the word is it's funny like someone said that the, the theater was laughing so hard that they're missing some of the dialogue because it's just like and i was like huh okay so now i'm actually kind of intrigued i i haven't dude i actually have never seen a teenage a tm anyway i've never seen a ninja turtles movie in the theater in my life uh so this oh, i've be seen a- many um i think i saw the original live action ones in the theater uh but that's an interesting franchise because in the comic books when the first comics first came out they were super dark like it was not a kid's comic book at all um and then it blew up for kids that the animated series and the toys and all that stuff was was our childhood right or 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 our childhood uh because my brother is nine years younger than me and he had them all right so i grew up with him in my house i've seen all of the original cartoons you know all that stuff and uh you know, like I said, I, I have downstairs, I have the first graphic novel that Eastman and Laird did. And it's super gritty and dark and the art style is different. Um, this one feels almost like they they took that art style and made it younger and brighter and all that. Plus, they made the turtles young, like they're young teenagers in this. Um, and so there's a little bit of, I think, of a coming of age story in there, too, that um, that they haven't really told before. So I think that's one of the things that they're doing that that's going to make it fun too. Um, the, I think this is the first time that April O'Neil is not white. Yep. Um, I don't know if she's black or Latina, but she's, you know, definitely of color. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think uh, it also caps, it gives me a bit of a spider verse vibe as well. Yes. And I'm sure. sure if the spider verse thing is going to continue. Cause I mean, yeah, I do dig that animation style. It, it is really, it's a treat for the eyes. So yeah, I think it's I think it's I think we're ripe for a different kind of animation. And I think um Spider-Verse brings that and looks like this brings that. Um, because we've been on this either Disney Pixar, very sort of lifelike but animated kind of thing, or you know, just the good old fashioned straight up animation. And I think this is so different that that it it's really fresh and and fun. Uh, we talked a little bit about the animation in, in Spider-Verse and just how wild they went with that. Um, and I think that's that's really cool. So, yeah, I'm I'm excited to see it. Again, I probably won't see it in the theater. Uh, funny enough, I almost ended up seeing The Meg 2 in the theater. Wow. Uh, of all the movies that are out right now, that was almost the one that I went and saw because and th- here's, here's a transition for you. So me and my kids have been on a tear of watching really, really bad movies. Um, we love the Meg because it's dumb and it's fun. Uh, you know, there's no, there's just no reason this movie should have ever been made. And I think when I originally saw it, 
I think I actually saw it with uh, our original host, Opie and Alex. I think we we saw it together um, in the theater. Maybe Pete too, but I can't remember. And uh, and I, I love Moonfall. And Moonfall is one of the worst movies I've ever seen. Moonfall is, it, it, it is a horrible, horrible film. It, uh, the accuracy behind that film is absolutely preposterous. Like there's, it's bad. It's Bonnie, like, I hope you see it one day. Oh, I, I've not heard of it. So, so, so the, the gist basically is the moon is like starting to crash into the earth. Because and... it's hollow and alive. <sighs> it <looks> well <laughs> <laughs> That's like the opening scene. But, yeah. but there is some serious, like if you ever saw Independence Day back in the day, maybe not, but did you see that one? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, yeah, I feel like the closest thing to it, because there's things in Independence Day you're like, come on, like, no one, like, uploading a computer virus into the alien ship and that's how they beat them are you serious like stop you know so there's a lot of that stuff in this movie and yeah dude like i loved it just because it was just dude it's the moon and the moon is scraping the <laughs> earth like that's fucking cool i'm sorry <laughs> i'm not making apologies for that anyway i hope you see uh, it but yeah but so when me and my kids finally watch it i mean we were dying we were laughing so much like it's not supposed to be as funny as we found it, but that's why we love it so much. And so that started us down this road of watching movies that aren't very good. So like one of them, we did watch Independence Day. We, you know, we've watched so many things. And finally, inevitably, we found ourselves landed on the Fast and the Furious. Now, not only are these movies, you know, corny car racing 90s, uh, late 90s, early 2000s movies, but they don't know how to name a fucking movie to save their life. Mm. So we went to Netflix and we put on Fast and Furious. Fast and Furious is the fourth movie in the franchise. Oh, it's four? It's the fourth. The okay. first movie is The Fast and The Furious. Yeah. Cool. They didn't put any numbers in there. But the second movie is Too Fast and Too Furious. Yes. Cool. So that one has a number in it. The third movie is The Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift. Yes. No indication that it's the third. Finally, when you get to the fifth movie, which we haven't Fast started five. yet, that one's called Fast Five. Yeah. So they finally threw in a number. Don't worry, <laughs> they stopped doing that in a minute too. So like, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know who's responsible for for like naming the franchise. And like the first one was kind of fun. Like it, it fit yeah. into this, you know, it, it created this little world, and and you know, Paul Walker's a handsome son of a bitch uh vin vin diesel is you know grumpy and moody you had michelle rodriguez um jordana brewster although you know she's kind of she's not anybody that's you know going to draw draw a crowd or anything um but it told a fun story you had you know lots of car racing chases you know crime you know all, all the stuff that makes for a fun movie and you know and it was fine and the second one was really bad and it, or no, it wasn't really bad but it wasn't as good as the first one you didn't have vin diesel at all uh which i didn't remember that being the case oh yeah um i and, absolutely remember that yeah and so i think they um, mentioned him at the end of the movie yeah and, and then you go to tokyo drift who has nobody in it absolutely nobody um and then at the very end uh vin diesel shows up like at the very, very end, just for like two seconds. And it turns out not only can they not name a movie, but the Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift takes place after the sixth or seventh film, even though it was the third film to come out. Right? I did you not look know confused. That. Yeah, neither did I. I. Did and they do not that. explain that at all. So, because um, there's only one character that carries over that I know of, um, and that's Han, who's, uh, you know, he's, he's, they're in Japan, I think. So he's Japanese. Um, and he's super likable. Like he's really, he's really great. And he, he dies in Tokyo Drift, but oh. then he's like in the next Fast and the Furious movie. So you're like, what? Okay. Yeah. And so we've now made it to the fourth film, which we just finished. It was also not particularly good, but it had a lot of, you know, decent action. Like that, that's the thing to remember with these films. I think these lend themselves better to this idea than even Mission Impossible does because Mission Impossible has this feel of, not, if it's not realism, it's at least drama. Like there's some some serious like 
um, stakes to these movies, whereas The Fast and the Furious is just crazy. Um, and it's just about cars, and they do weird shit with cars that probably aren't realistic at all. Um, and that's fine. Um, but it's just, they're more fun. They're more ridiculous than, than the Mission Impossible films. And I think in a way that lends itself well to the films because if you don't if you don't buy it you can just have fun with it you don't have to you know throw everything in there and um this is the fourth film i think is the worst rated of all of the fast and furious movies so tomorrow night we'll probably start fast five and on the flip side this is one of the most popular ones and you can see even behind me all these cast of characters are starting to come in so um gal gal gadot who's wonder woman she pops up in the fourth one so we've now seen her uh they killed off i say with air quotes because i'm pretty sure she comes back in later movies they killed off michelle rodriguez just off screen they're just like yeah she's dead (laughs) and you're like okay (laughs) like that was neat um and then to you know add to the the film in fast five Dwayne shows up and that's how you know it's getting good because yeah. Dwayne the Rock Johnson shows up. And if there's anybody that'll tell you that it's a great film, it's Dwayne the Rock Johnson because nobody loves Dwayne the Rock Johnson more than Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Um, <laughs> as we saw with Black Adam. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, they're not good, but they are fun. They have some cool cars in there. The 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 Tokyo Drift one, I think is better than people gave it credit for. Uh, but it's a little hard because um, what's his name? Lucas Black has the southernest accent I've ever heard, and I'm like, calm down, Sling Blade. Just get get behind the wheel and drive. Like his his accent's so thick. Um, and he's over there in Japan, and then uh, they they do this whole thing when they're talking about drifting, and they and they're like driving and drifting down this um, kind of windy mountain road, and they're just having this casual conversation. Like they're barely even driving and it's almost, I don't know. They're supposed to be like explaining the romance of drifting, like the, you know, the way, I don't know. I don't know. It's weird, but I mean, again, they're fun movies. I'm, I'm excited enough for the fifth one, knowing that it's supposed to be better than the others. But I think it's, I think this is where they find their footing because I think that they finally become full on just heist movies. Yeah. You know, like uh, Paul Walker's character to this point has still always been an FBI agent. Like he's always out there doing cop things and, um, you know, kind of walking the line. And I know by the, by the end of the series, he's just full on bad seed. Right. Uh, so, you know, it, it'll be, it'll be fun to see that happen. Um, I don't remember which is his last film, like when he passed away. Um, yeah. It's seven yeah. or eight, I think. Um but um but that'll be interesting to see where they go with that too um because i don't i don't know much about the fast and the furious franchise after the first film um i had he i know i think i saw the second one in the theater i didn't remember a damn thing about it um so it uh like i said it's been fun my it's really fun to watch bad movies with my kids because they're smart enough to know they're bad so we laugh at the things that are just stupid um and, and that's a lot of fun but how old are uh, your kids uh those two uh, are 12 and 15 my okay. middle one's too cool for that shit he wants to go play football yeah. and play video games he's upstairs playing Fortnite all day um <laughs> so but my 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 book ends as i call them my, my oldest and my youngest are, are um they're funny and they're both very creative and very you know they they, they like to tell stories and and stuff like that and so they see the problems in the stories pick them out and then we have a lot of fun with it so um it works really well but yeah that's all i got i know i know i watched something else and and i've said this before uh but i've been watching way too much love island the uk love island it's uh that season is technically over i'm still like two episodes behind so i'll finish that soon but thank God the American Love Island is on now. So I've got like 60 more episodes of that to watch. So I'm good there. Um, and uh, and that's like it. I don't know what we're going to watch before next week. I have no idea. Um, Strange New Worlds has been really good. 
Yeah. The last episode was the musical episode, mm -hmm. uh, which was a trip. It was a trip to see them sit down and make a musical um, and have it be good. Like it, it, it has a little bit of the corny, but it's Star Trek and you can do that. Um, but they, there are some people on that show with some pretty impressive voices. Um, I forget his first name, but Gregory Peck's son. What's his, what's his Ethan. name? Ethan. Ethan Peck. He's got a cool voice. Like, you know, his speaking, it's very much like his speaking voice, but it's really good. Um, uh, Lon Noonien Singh, she actually is a singer and she's got a beautiful voice. Like she's, she's fantastic. Um, so that's a lot of fun. And then I know the next episode is going to be, they're going to go back to kind of heavy and dark for the finale. So um, I'm pretty excited for that. Word. And by the way, to, uh, just really quick for if you, when you do go back to discovery, make sure you watch this short treks because there's little like five to like 20 minute little episodes that bridge the gap between season one and season two. And those little episodes absolutely like pay, like they, they pay off in season two. Like they're, they're connected for most of it. So yeah, that's a huge part of what made me like discovery. Um, something else you mentioned about Love Island really quick, you know, you know, Saloni, um, out of curiosity, like, are you like a reality TV person? You know, some people are, some people aren't. Um, so yeah. No, I am. I'm in the camp of, I am not a reality TV. Yeah. Person. Same. Me too. Same. Me too. I th Love Island is like, uh, you know what I say that, but I watch Love Island and then I watch cooking shows. So I watch MasterChef, uh, you know, uh, with the kids, we watch um, Crime Scene Kitchen, which is a fun one. Um, the point of that show is you have these, all these bakers come in and then they go into a room where something's already been baked and they have like two minutes to look at everything that's been made and then try and make what they think was made. And then it's a competition show to see who could come as close as possible. That's fascinating. Fun. It's, it's, it is, it's a lot of fun. Um, you know, it's hosted by um, Joel McHale. Uh, yeah. So he's funny. Uh, it's got Curtis Stone as one of the judges. There's a, a woman named Yolanda Gamp who um, is a cake decorator on YouTube and she's really great. So it's it's a fun show. And then I watch Master Chef. I'll watch Hell's Kitchen, um, Top Chef when it's on. I love Top Chef. Mm -hmm. But like, it's either Love Island or cooking shows, and that's like where my reality TV ends. Um, but I won't watch like um, Big Brother or Amazing Race or any of those. It's we Survivor. it's weird where my standards are. It's it's really it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> As long as there's cooking involved, you're in. And that makes sense, you know? Yeah, for most oh, of it. Oh, totally random. Uh, Sloan, did you ever work in a restaurant? I did, yeah, for yes. about six months. Yeah. I'm the only one who's never worked in a restaurant. I can't, I swear to God, I'm looking for somebody else to, like, join me in my non-restaurant life, you know? Everyone. Uh, I, I complained on the last show. Like, I, I applied. Again, I, I was rejected by a and I was rejected by Taco Bell. I was rejected by McDonald's. <laughs> um no one would hire me like what the fuck i'm sorry what the hell like like <laughs> you know so what, what where did you work uh, uh for six months it was a nepalese restaurant in davis huh. yeah like a family-owned oh. restaurant where um you uh, as a staff person i bust the tables but i also was a server and seating people so it was a combination of everything and boy did i mess up a few orders yeah that that's <laughs> quite memorable <laughs> well since since you have worked in restaurant have you seen the bear have you watched that i have yet? not no i have heard about it i keep hearing about it even at work and i know andrew you've mentioned it too but i haven't i don't even know what it's about i'm guessing there's some sort of restaurant yeah theme to it yeah. okay did you start it andrew uh, yeah dude so thank you for the reminder i did start it but check this out i'm still only on episode one man so basically i might actually do the bear before i do strange new worlds actually because yeah bandwidth because the bear does look good and again like you got you know you guys are talking about oh myers breaks the shit out of the characters i want to do that now what's his name um Kermie. like he i like i don't know him that well but I'm already thinking like possibly INTJ, possibly, 
Um, but we'll see. I mean, I, I've only seen one episode so far, but I do know that he kind of has a stick up his ass compared to the rest. And but at the same time, he has a vision. And I feel like sometimes that's kind of like their role. Like they they have a vision, but they have to learn how to like mesh with like other fucking humans. And I feel like that's Carmi's like challenge um so yeah. far. Yeah, and and the chef world which he is actually a part of when he comes into the restaurant, it's just like a little, a little sandwich shop, right? Like it's not a sit down fine dining restaurant. And when you're from, we've talked about it, but when you come from fine dining, that's like militant, like there are roles and you do those roles and you do these specific things Structure. in a very specific way. Cause I was telling my, my son, my middle son, he, he was like, he was joking about, you know, he's like, Oh, I could be a cook. And I was like, dude, if you wanted to make it, you would be miserable because he he has like ADHD. And I was like, you couldn't sit down because when you start in a real restaurant, so when you're moving your way up, you start as a prep cook, which means you sit there with onions and you chop those fucking onions and then you do more onions and then you do more onions and then you do more onions. And then the next day you come in and you do more onions. Like it's just the same stuff every day. And, and until you, you're perfect at that, and then they move you to something else, and then you have to be perfect at that. And then it's very, it's very militant, you know, the, the yes chef thing is, is real, like that's in, in fine dining restaurants, and it reminds you of the military where you're like, sir, yes, sir, every sentence begins and ends with sir, you know, and it's, it's a trip, it's really, it's really interesting to watch the bear because you have this collision of of restaurant worlds right like this this very just homey right, like oh. restaurant where they're they're not legit and then this guy's that's coming in from culinary school working with you know big names knows big names has done all this stuff um and so it, it is a total collision of worlds um and super interesting yeah well that's um i'll go Oh, quick thing I just was going to say, since you're talking about chef and the yes chef thing, there, there's a movie, um, I'm forgetting the name of it, uh, but it's got the actress from the Queen's. Yes, yep. the menu. menu. The menu. The menu. Have you? Uh, you yes. I'll watch that. Okay. That Have you seen it? Great. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So that, I talked about this last week or the week before, how it's this it, it takes the same kind of subject that the bear uses, but in a an extreme way, right? Like obviously no chef is just going to kill himself in front of everybody because he's not going to be good enough, right? Like it's all extreme, but at the same time, it, if you dial what they do back like three steps, that is how a restaurant works. He walks in, he says, how's everybody doing? They're like, good chef. And they all stand at it, like at attention and they do their stuff. Like a big time, big time chef is, is King. Like he is, he's the guy. And so um, for as preposterous as the movie is on one level, it's also very accurate. And then, you know, the, the one that I pointed out last, last week or the week before that I thought was interesting is you have the rich couple and he says, you know, how many times you've been to my restaurant? And they're like, uh, I don't know, three or four times. And he's like, six times. You've been to my restaurant six times. You know, what's the last thing you ordered? And he's like, uh, I don't know the the chicken. And he's like, no, it wasn't the chicken. He's like, you don't even know what you've ordered. He's like, I create an experience and you just come in because you can. You don't even care. Right? So like, it's all of those things. So it's th that movie is talking about just every angle of the restaurant you, know, you have all the different people um and the way they interact with food you've got um nicholas holt who's the total ass kisser right um you know and, and everybody in that film um it's super interesting it's just a it's a different take on the same subject saloni after uh, uh messing up orders aside you know did you enjoy your experience um, in, in in the restaurant world, or were you like, oh, I'm good? <laughs> yeah, I, I I sort of felt like, okay, I've done this, I'm I'm good. I, I think uh, restaurant life is not for me. Uh, I'll move on to something else. But it was still a good experience to have. You just you learn a lot of appreciation for the service staff, and that service industry, and the pressure they're under. And, uh, yeah, can only. 
Yeah. yeah. Word. Well, I want to thank you uh, for coming on the show and for, you know, you've never done a podcast before. I know you listen to podcasts and um, I think that we got a lot of good uh, information on the whole Seth uh, thing. So Kevin, props to you for asking about the books thing, because that was like, you dropped some knowledge. And I'm hoping that, you know, some of the people listening uh, might even, you know, have their minds like opened up, you know, hearing about this 60s, 70s and 80s uh, stuff. It sounds pretty dense and, and, and esoteric, frankly. And, I'm, and I feel like the 60s and 70s especially were, were really into that hidden knowledge stuff. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm about that life too, shit. So thank you for, for sharing that and not being shy and, and, and joining us. I think this is a very chill, flowy, cool conversation. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I, yeah, I enjoyed it. Thank, and thank you. Thank you to both of you for having me on. Uh, it was just fun to be a part of this. Yeah, I'm glad we may, uh, I don't know. We may call on you again. You never know, you know, we, Awesome. You can always use extra people. I really get tired of Andrew sometimes, you know? <laughs> yeah, and I get totally tired of Kevin, too. Um, but I know from a Myers-Briggs uh, tip, you know, I'm not going to like... But, you know, anyways, your energy is, is a cool, different energy to have on the show as well. And I think that, you know, it's all about uh, representing as many cool, different sides as possible. And I can't wait for the netizens and the uh, APNC uh, diehards to, to meet you. Yeah. Well, with that, I will say, uh, well, thank you for watching anybody that, that is watching and, and uh, we will see you next week. Bye. <laughs>